Uh, since it's about one o'clock, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we explore the exhibition, The Long Way Home. Um, my name is Amy Consalvi. I am the Director of Education and Visitor Services at the museum. And um, I'm delighted that you are all joining us here today. Um, I think it's safe to say that some, if not most of us in attendance today, have some special memory of the museum's founder, Gordon Langton, whether it was being invited into his office to get a sneak peek of his toy car collection or being offered an explanation of one of his favorite icons, St. Paris Gava. Gordon made sure every visitor felt welcome in his museum. When COVID-19 hit and the museum made the difficult decision to temporarily close, staff had to quickly rearrange the exhibition schedule. When it came time to reopen, we decided that the long way home would be the perfect way to greet our visitors again, offering a moment of calm and an escape from these turbulent times. And although Gordon doesn't visit the museum too often these days, his warmth and welcoming is present thanks to the beautiful photographs on view. Uh, I'd like to introduce today's speakers in the order that they are presenting. Uh, we will have a moderated uh, Q&A, and if time allows, uh, we will take um, a few audience questions. Kent Russell uh, probably does not need any introduction, uh, but he is the founding executive director of the museum. As an art historian with extensive museum experience, he worked side by side with Gordon to establish a world-class museum with a world-class collection held to the highest standards in the field. Karen Langton is Gordon's middle daughter and self-appointed family historian. She has worked closely with his many collections and spent countless hours combing through the Long Way Home book, eventually bringing the book to life using the geodatabase management application, Esri, which she'll explore in her presentation and is available on our website. And finally, Chris Stratford, curator of the Long Way Home, has had the privilege of being Gordon's personal assistant and project manager for the last five years. Chris has a BFA in photography and visual design, and her career in the graphic design photography industry spans 28 years. So I will turn it over to Kent Russell, our director. And I unmute myself. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, this is the first time the museum has had an in-depth look at our founder, Gordon Langton. So what makes him tick? Um, who is he? And uh, to understand that, you have to go back a bit and you have to go back before his extraordinary business career. Um, the museum represents an apogee for Gordon as a collector. He had many different collection interests, but the Museum of Russian Icons and the Russian Icons that he assembled is the finest collection of Russian icons outside of the country of Russia and the most extensive. So we offer a virtually encyclopedic um, experience of the Russian sacred tradition, the Byzantine with Byzantine roots, that is, um, of the uh, icon itself. And um, it, it is a unique museum, an extraordinary uh, legacy that Gordon has left uh, to the United States and to the community around Clinton where he made his fortune. Um, in 1957, he uh, got out of the army and he decided to cross the world. He actually circumvented the world, if you include his trip uh, from his home in Peoria to Germany, where he served in the army, and then he went east, uh, right across uh, the entirety of the rest of the globe, uh, taking extraordinary photographs. And when uh, Chris Stratford uh, first showed me sort of the range of them, my first reaction was, this isn't about Gordon Langton, this is about art. This is a photographer who has an eye, who has a sense of how to make a composition. And remember, all these photographs are pre-digital. They're not manipulated in any way. So the picture that you see is the eye of Gordon Langton. He composed them. He established the shutter speed, the f-stop, um, and he used ect uh, Kodak ectochrome uh, film so it's, or slides. So they're very good quality, uh, extraordinary documentation of a world that is completely changed. And what makes him tick is people. And I know Chris Stratford will talk about this. Um, 
Above all, Gordon respected people and valued their work. And these photographs are about people, their faces, their work. And faces were very important to Gordon. Um, it's something that he kept on returning to, and we shouldn't be surprised that his major collection happens to be Russian icons, whose central motif, of course, is the, fa uh, the face of the sacred person who's being depicted. Um, so you'll see uh, throughout this program uh, what, what interested him, uh, what made him extraordinary, and uh, why he did this. And we look forward to your questions, if there are any, at the end of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Kent, for your comments. Um, one thing I will say uh, for those visitors who have had the opportunity to come to the museum since we've reopened and view the photographs, they are just amazed at what they're seeing. And they, they say, oh, you know, I was kind of expecting amateur photography, but I'm getting a professional level show. And people are just so impressed. Um, so great job, Chris, with the image selection and the production of the, the, the printed photographs. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Karen Langton. Thanks, Amy. Um, what I'd like to start with is what exactly a story map is, in case you're not familiar with them. Um, Esri, as uh, Amy mentioned earlier, they do a lot of mapping software. And one of the things that they came out with is a story map, which allows you to combine interactive maps and images and other kind of media, such as videos and text, into a story that you can then put on the web browser. Um, I am a Red Cross volunteer, and I learned about these story maps because I do a lot of mapping for them. And in a disaster such as a hurricane, we use these story maps to um, both provide um, the status of our activities that we're doing on the disaster to the managers, as well as providing stories to the other partners and donors so that they're aware of the services we're offering. So um, I'd like to tell you about how I got started on this project. And it actually started quite a while ago. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, my father, with a friend from Rotary, decided to actually publish his journal. And I had, prior to this, had never actually read it. In fact, I'm not sure I ever even saw it. <laughs> and so when the book came out, I sat down and read it and um, was quite impressed with it. And the, one of the things that really stood out is that he kept talking about, oh, this was a great picture I took today. I just can't wait to see it. And if you saw the first version of the book, there were no pictures in it. <laughs> so that really piqued my interest. So then I went out and I bought a slide scanner and I scanned in all 1,300 of his pictures. So then I could, then I had the pictures and I had the story. Still didn't quite have them tied together. So when I started working with the Red Cross and I learned what a story map was immediately, I knew that was what I wanted to use to put his story together. So I started on this, it was about 2016. And um, it wasn't an easy job. I had to, I pretty much had to go through the story country by country and pick out you know, interesting things that I really wanted to see. I had to compare it to the set of pictures that I had and try to put it together. So, um, so that's the process that I went through. And in 2009, they started talking about this exhibition and I thought this would, might be a good thing to accompany the exhibition. Well, at two, in 2009, I was only three quarters of the way through the book. So I still had a ways to go. <laughs> and then to top it off, Edsri came out with a new story map format, which I like better. And so I decided to transfer what I had done into the new format. So needless to say, I had a very busy winter because I had to convert it and then finish the book. Um, as I was reading the book, there's a couple areas that are themes that really came out that I, that I really wanted to capture in the story map. Um, one was just his first impression, his impression of every country. So I tried to, to take excerpts 
from his stories or his journal that explained what he thought of each country. And also, I really wanted to capture the culture. His, his pictures do it a lot, but so do his words. They really add to it. So that's, I was focusing on that. But beyond that, this is a picture of a particular uh, time period. You know, it was the 1957s. I wasn't even born yet. I didn't know a whole lot about it. And there's a lot of things going on. Like right before he took off on his trip, they had the Hungarian Revolution and then the Suez Canal, or <laughs> Suez Canal crisis. That happened the week before he left. So I found myself as I was reading the book, Googling everything. He, he talks about movies he goes to and what he liked and didn't like, and I'd Google the movie. He talked about people he met, and I was wondering, are these people famous? And I'd Google the people's names. And um, I found that very interesting. So I wanted to add that into it so that people could explore these things that they may not be familiar with. Um, and then the final theme was really, as he was going through this experience, he was really growing and understanding himself better. And if you read it, there's a lot of passages about how he felt he was changing as he was going through his trip. And that was another thing I really wanted to capture in the story map. So now I'd like to actually open up the story map and go through some of it with you so you can see how it's laid out. You know, it's a, it's a big project and it'll take you a while to go through it. So we're just gonna touch on it so you can do it on your own later. So. So this is um, what they call a collection, and it's actually a group of story maps that all go together so that you can easily go between all the different stories. So as you can see, I, I have this first story that's um, kind of an introduction and in what led up to him leaving on his trip. And then I broke it up into countries. So I have Europe and Iran, Iraq, Pakistan um, to make small um smaller story maps so you could go through one story map and then maybe come back another day and do another one and then at the end um i decided uh, you know one of the things that he talks about in the story map is what his plan was for the future and how you know a lot of it was idealistic about how he thought life should be and how he could make it better. And I wanted to capture, you know, my impression. At this point when I was working on this, he really couldn't tell me what he meant by that and whether he accomplished it. So I tried to take what I knew of his life and show how he accomplished what he talked about. So let's open up the first story map. Um, all the story maps are set up kind of the same. They have a title page and then this bar right here, that's actually um, kind of your chapters and you can click on it, it'll take you to that part of the chapter. So, um, we'll, we'll start scrolling down a little bit and you'll see how I've incorporated pictures along with words. So this is his, a picture of his original journal. Um, earlier this year, I actually started going through a lot of my parents' things in their house and organizing them. And I actually came across a lot of documents. So what you'll see in this section are actually his letters and other information that he had while he was planning the trip. So it really added a, a nice dimension to the story. I actually captured a video. This is a really short video and it shows my father for Christmas, he received a globe. And it, it looks like he was interested in traveling the world way back when he was eight. And you can see whenever there's a blue line on the side, that's a quote. So that came either directly out of his journal or it came out of his, um, the epilogue to the, in the book. And then I have a couple pictures of the people he went with. 
This was his traveler par traveling partner, George. That was a good friend of his from college. And right before the trip, he got married. So that was his wife, Judy, that went along on the trip as well. I'm gonna skip down to the trip planning. Um, right here, this is actually one of the interactive maps. So you can click on the corner and you can expand it. And all these orange dots are a day on this trip. So if you click on one of those dots, it should pop up a, a little um, window. And it tells you when he arrived there, how many kilometers he traveled. And um, some of these countries have changed names since he was there. So I, I've always listed the name that he called it at the top, but I also give you the present day name. But if it didn't change, it just stays the same. Now you'll note on the bottom that this one says one to six. And what that indicates is there's actually six dots there because he was there for six days. So you can go through it and you see this is probably the day he arrived because he actually traveled on that day. And it, there's also a button so you could actually zoom right into it and get a better view. And you can move around this map, you can explore it and, and click on all the dots. And it won't, it won't change it when you come back and you hit this home button it'll go right back the way it was. But that's a nice feature of these story maps that you can actually get in and, and study the map in detail. Um, I'm gonna move on to one of the other stories. So up here at the top is the navigation. Now, depending on what you're looking at, this will change a little bit. It may go on to the side, say if you're on an iPad, or an iPhone, but it'll be somewhere. This, these squares here will take you back to the, the list of all the story maps, but these here will let you go sequentially through them. So I'm gonna go down to Europe and I'm gonna go down to Austria so I can click on here. I tried to put a map in front of each country so that you could study the the country in more detail. Um, I had mentioned that I tried to capture some of the history and I actually recruited my nephew, Brian Revis. He's a, a big history buff. And so he helped me in creating a couple stories and these are separate story maps and I'm just linking to them. So you click on here and you can go and you can learn about the Hungarian revolution. And as I mentioned, that happened a week or two before his trip. And so his whole trip through Europe, everyone he ran into was talking about it. Um, another thing that I tried to capture in here was the artwork because he, he purchased a lot of artwork on this trip. Um, we'll go to Iran and I'll show you some of the artwork. Um, these were some paintings, and I have the passage here about how he found two paintings that he couldn't resist, and they cost him $20, which actually back then was a, a fair amount of money. <laughs> so there's one of them, it's a barber, and then the other one was a cobbler. So we still had these pictures, and um, so we took a picture of them and put them in here. And it, when you get to Bali, he, that's where he really found all the um, wood carvers. In fact, why don't we go right there? Uh, Bali was was his favorite country. He, he is leading up to it. He was anticipating it so much, as you can read in that first passage. He's heard so much about it, and he was just dying to see what it was like. Um, let me get down to his wood carvings. So most of the time he was in Bali, he was traveling around trying to find people that were wood carvers. And this guy was one of his favorites and he actually purchased these wood carvings. So as you go through here, you'll see shots of all the wood carving. Oops, I must not have put it right there. It's a little farther on, there we go. There's a picture of him with the wood carvings. 
and the guy that carved them. And then you'll see I have some pictures of the wood carvings. Um, if you're looking at this and the picture goes off the screen, if you tap it once, it'll shrink it down to the size that you're looking at. And there's some more wood carvings. So there's a number of wood carvings in this section. Um, let's go back here. Uh, what, one of the things he did throughout the trip was anytime he went, arrived in a new location, he immediately set out to find people he could talk to that would tell him about the country. Uh, a lot of times he'd go to the universities in the bigger cities, but sometimes he was in small towns. And in those cases, he actually sought out the school teachers or the school superintendents. So in Iran, he actually stopped by and met a school teacher. Um, nope, maybe it was in Iran. Uh, oh, sorry, it was Pakistan. So here's a picture. So he ran into the school teacher, talked to him for a long time, and actually got invited to his house and met all his kids. And that was one of the ways that he learned about families. And, and generally, the school teacher spoke English, so it was easy for him to communicate with them. Now, let's see. I'm going to go to um, Burma and Laos. Burma is um, the same as what we call Myanmar, Myan, Myanmar, Myanmar <laughs> now. So um, when he was here, the big city's down at the bottom, but he actually met up with some people that were traveling and he hooked, hitched a ride with them and went all around this area, which was a tribal area, and learned quite a bit on that trip. He also did the same thing in Laos. So he really got to, he, he went, this is the normal area you stop at the border, but he went way into Laos and really got to know the people and the culture, particularly of the tribal people. So now I'm gonna to go to Japan. Um, Japan, um, he had been to Japan once before. He was in Japan when he was in college as part of the uh, Japanese American Student Alliance. And so he had a, a lot of friends in Japan. And most of what he did there was visit his friends. So he spent a lot of time at the houses of his friends. Uh, this person right here is Taizo Matsui, who who was a lifelong friend of his and uh, even a business part partner later in his life. And then the last section was um, returning home. And as you can see from the menu here, I go through what his first job was, what his personal life was. Um, you can see that that's where he first started working was in DuPont. There's his wedding picture. And then I talk about his career, his, his art collections, honors. And the last section is just uh, comments from him on his view of his upcoming uh, future and, and how he would achieve what his goals were. So hopefully um, you can explore this story map on your own and uh, get a much better sense for who he was. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I know when Kent first mentioned that you were putting together a map for us, the staff had no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> which is sometimes often the case. But, uh, you know, and I don't think any of us expected uh, 
what you what you ended up creating um it's just such a valuable resource and to see um all of these countries you know in a historical context i think especially nowadays is just so important and to have all of those details highlighted um, is really just fantastic so um, i think i did mention in my intro it is available on our website um, but i do always send out a follow-up email uh, to all of our participants so i will include that link so everyone can further explore um, the the journey because it's really between the photographs and you know his observations about the world at that time uh, is really just astounding so um, Last but not least, um, I'd like to turn it over to Chris. Uh, she has worked so hard on this exhibition. Um, she's a dear friend of Gordon's, and um, I think she has a lot of interesting things to say about this process. Thank you, Amy. Um, I was very, very fortunate um, for the last five years to be um, Gordon's personal assistant project manager. Um, it truly was just an honor and a privilege. So Gordon, when I first met him, he had told me he had written this book, The Long Way Home, and he gave me a copy to read. So I would go home and read it, and we'd come, I'd come back and we would discuss it. So I had the unique and amazing opportunity to read along with Gordon and discuss his book. Um, not many people have the opportunity to do that, so it was thrilling and riveting. And I learned, what I learned from talking to Gordon about his book was that um, you know, even 60 years later, that um, the excitement and the profoundness of this trip to him was as fresh and meaningful as the day he started and the day he completed his journey. Um, it had such a profound effect on his life and everything he did. Um, I also learned that he was a, a bit of a citizen of the world, if you will, and as Kent had mentioned, he had extraordinary interest in people and how um, their systems worked in their country. And, and every person he met along the way was of value to him, whether they were a shopkeeper, um, you know, or um, a laborer or a politician or a teacher, it didn't matter. Everybody, Gordon felt had something to offer. Um, and so meeting all these people, um, and of course always starting up a conversation no matter where he went because he was so interested in everybody, um, really helped form his global view. And um, the fact that he had such a global view before he even left on this trip was perhaps a bit unusual for that time. Um, but he really, really wanted to see how the world worked and how people re interacted with each other and um, how the outside world affected them as well. So as we talked about it, um, you know, I got great insight to his thinking and um, what he was looking for in different countries. So um, I just happened to ask Karen, um, you know, if there were any original slides still, you know, left because this was 60 years later. And Gordon had preserved them um, in two boxes. And, you know, there were over 1,200 or 1,300 of them. Um, so when she brought them, I would, it was amazing. I, they were preserved as much as the day he took them. And what I learned by looking through all those, as well as reading um, passages with Gordon from the book and discussing it, is that his photographs really brought that book to life. And his photographs were a reflection of exactly what he was thinking in that moment. Um, he never posed people. Um, he always captured them in their element, in their moment. And that was very important to him um, because he wanted to see um, um, how people lived and reacted to different people in different environments. So I think the um, precise technological thinking of an engineer in the heart of an artist that Gordon was combined in we had these 1300 extraordinary images and extraordinarily preserved. They were, uh, they're amazing. Um, so he, he just wanted to showcase people. He wanted to learn from them. One of his quotes in the book is, um, I like to live in the country that I'm in, um, which is so true to his words as well as the photographs um, when you look at them. And you can see his passion, his curiosity, and his warmth in his photographs. Um, and of course, this was a time way before digital imaging and all. And 
so as he took them he might not see them for months um so he was um very precise in what he did and he would have tremendous patience at times waiting um you know on the side of the road near a rice paddy or climbing up to the tallest part of um, a mountain um, to take that right photograph um, he also did not take a lot of photographs of buildings and things like that um, because again it was the people he was interested in um, in, but the photographs that he did take of um, buildings and things were taken from such an angle that they became works of art themselves. So it was really um, amazing and a privilege to look through all these slides to um, put this exhibition together. But the words, Gordon's words are true to his photographs or his photographs are true to his word. So it was very, very easy to expound on what he had shown in the book um, and give people a glimpse, a little bit deeper glimpse into um, his travels and his journey and what he learned from them. So um, I always called it to Gordon his nine month moment in time. Um, and we used to just laugh about that. Um, and we would um, just um, go on and on with different things. and. You know, he would tell me different stories about different countries and and um, how he enjoyed searching for what he called true artists. Um, he didn't want the tchotchkes or he didn't really want what was presented in, in cities and towns and villages. He, he wanted to meet the people whose work that he admired. Um, so he would actually go into the countryside and, you know, seek out people who were carving wood or painting and things like that because he wanted to meet them. Um, and because the art meant more to him when he could meet them and understand their story. And some of these people he remained lifelong friends with. And he kept all the artwork and all the wood carvings, which we have safely, um, tucked away. And um, it was really just um, an extraordinary journey with him. And I was, uh, privileged and proud to be part of it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I know this exhibition definitely would not have happened without the hard work you put into it and all the time you spent one-on-one -on -one, um, with Gordon reminiscing. Uh, is there any fun little story that you would like to share with the audience um, while you were kind of going through everything with him? Hmm. Let's see. See, um, well, when he first gave me the book, and Gordon being an engineer, of course, um, and I started reading it, he would, you know, quiz me and um, ask me different things. And, um, and he said, you know, so what do you think? What do you think of the writing and all? And I would tell him, well, it's very precise. And he would tell me, just keep reading, just keep reading. And as you read the book, you really see um, the artist side of him come out and the passion in his descriptions and the colorfulness of his descriptions as he traveled through. And you can see how the photograph, his camera and his um, journals became his companions mm -hmm. on the trip. So it was, it was really, really a lot of fun um, to, to go on this journey with him. Yeah, it's very, very special time <laughs> that you that you two spent together. That's a very special time. Yes. Um, and I know, uh, you know, every now and then, uh, when I first started working at the museum up at the front desk, uh, you know, we would have visitors come in and they would strike up a conversation with Gordon, not even realizing that he was the founder of the museum. And somehow they would wind up on the topic of the motorcycle journey. And uh, visitors would just leave just stunned that you know, they were a talking to a founder, you know, once they figured out <laughs> who it was they were speaking with, um, and that he had taken this incredible journey, you know, and that there was a book written about it. So yeah, that that Gordon, you know, just has such an incredible history, you know, and, and that history is continuing through the museum. So I think at this point, um, we're going to transition over to questions and answers. Um, I did some brainstorming with the visitor services team um, about some frequently asked questions that we, we get at the museum. Uh, and also I did survey some of our participants um, that registered early on. So I think we'll, we'll jump right into that. Uh, 
One of the most common questions we get is really, what was Gordon's motivation for taking the trip? Were there any specific events in his life that sparked this journey? And anybody can jump in. <laughs> Well, um, I can tell you that um, there were two motivations. Um, one, that he wanted to travel and see the world and learn from people. And two, he was um, sort of at a crossroads. He was trying to decide between a career in engineering um, and a career in foreign service. So um, he wanted to um, travel the world and meet with people in, in foreign service in very different countries to see what kind of lives they were living and what kind of impact they were having on their own country and you know countries surrounding them and the world um, so that seemed to be his two objectives for the trip um, I think that um, in my understanding is you know he he went on a trip when he was in high school um, um, through the northwest of this country and worked his way along with a, a good friend of his um, doing odd jobs and things to pay for the trip so I think Perhaps that might have started a little bit of wanderlust. Then um, he went to Mexico with George, who he, he went on um, this trip around the world, as we call it, with as well. Um, and it was on that trip to Mexico that they actually started thinking about planning this trip. Um, but I, I would say that, in my opinion, that um, when Gordon went to Japan, when he was in Cornell, I think that just sparked um, international interest and really took hold. Um, and one of the quotes from his book is that um, I strayed from my isolationist Midwest upbringing and became something of an internationalist. Mm -hmm. So, and that was after that trip to Japan. So he had a unique desire for a global view. And um, after he spent um, two years in the service in Germany, he um, this was something he really aspired to do before coming home. Great. Um, Karen, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Um, no, I think she did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so a lot of, we get a lot of questions about uh, the motorcycle itself. Um, this has come up a couple times, uh, you know, what, what is an NSU? You know, I think especially American audiences aren't quite familiar with the um, NSU brand. Uh, so the company actually started uh, making knitting machines from my understanding and then transitioned into um, sort of two wheelers starting with a, a penny farthing bicycle and then eventually made the motorcycle in 1901 and in 1905, I believe it was, created their first car. And they were sort of known as, as a luxury brand at that time, but they never really seemed to really catch on in the automobile market, from my understanding, and were um, bought out by Fiat. And uh, eventually, you know, of course, acquired by, by Audi, but they did continue to make motorcycles for, for a number of years and through the World Wars. Um, but why did Gordon exactly uh, decide to travel by motorcycle instead of other modes of transportation? And at the end of it all, what happened to the motorcycle at the end of the trip? I think Karen has a good answer for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason he wanted to go by motorcycle, and he says this at the beginning of the book, is that the motorcycle is very flexible. You can just take off and explore things. You can... Um, see things much easier from a motorcycle than driving around in a car and going places you couldn't go in a car. It actually turned out that it made, him, made it easier when he was forced to take a train. He could throw the motorcycle on the train and go by train. And um, it really helped him quite a bit. And it also was an attraction to all these villagers. So they'd see him show up with his motorcycle and there's so many pictures of all these people posing with the motorcycle. So it was a conversation starter, which really helped him as he arrived in these cities. But um, towards the end of the trip, while he was going through India, actually before he even got to India, he started um, trying to contact Burma to see how he could get into Burma on a motorcycle. Um, and he wasn't getting anywhere. He wasn't getting any response. He finally got to Calcutta and that was pretty much you know, the next stop was to go to Burma and he was still trying to contact him and no one would answer him and they were telling him it was not safe. 
So he decided that he finally gave up. In fact, I think I wrote down the day. If you want to go read about it, it was March 8th when he finally decided that he was not going to make it any further on his motorcycle. And as it turns out, his motorcycle was not actually moving at that point. It had some problems. So he took it to a dealership and this guy was going to take it apart while he went up to Nepal with um, George and Judy. So they were going to take a plane or something for a week. Well, he got back to Calcutta and he went to see the, this guy and the guy had it all in pieces and hadn't put it back together. And he was still trying to get to Burma, but I think he finally gave that up. And then he had to look into selling his motorcycle. So this guy that was fixing his motorcycle knew that, and he figured, well, I'm going to, you know, swindle this guy. I'm going to not put it back together because I know he's in a rush to move on. So here's all these parts, and he was not moving to put it back together. <laughs> but um, at the same time, my father had to go, and um, they were telling him he had to go all the way back to Pakistan to get rid of the motorcycle. He couldn't sell it in India. And so that took a couple days just negotiating that. He made it through that, and the guy still wasn't getting his motorcycle together. So he ended up finding the person that was in charge of all NSU dealerships in India, and that guy was on his side. So he eventually forced this dealership to put it back together and give him the price he had promised him for the motorcycle. But he did have to sell it. He sold it then. And and after that, he pretty much had to travel by boat or by plane or by train. So he wasn't happy about it, but he <laughs> kind of ran out of options. Yeah, I can, I can, I can just envision his reaction to to all of that. Um, I didn't. Uh, we we didn't discuss this question ahead of time, but it's it dawned on me that um, this is something we get a lot of questions or, or observations about um, in the museum when people are looking at the map. Um, in terms of all the different stops, uh, visitors are noticing that he essentially followed the Silk Road uh, in Marco Polo's journey. Was Do you know if that was intentional or was it just sort of by chance that that's how it worked out? Uh, I think it was by chance. I know that he, he had read a book from 1938 on someone that had done the same thing, ridden a motorcycle along this path. And I don't, I never read the book. I didn't look into it. So I don't know if it was the same path. Okay. But I, I think he just chose, he did have to change his route a little bit. There hmm. were some political issues and uh, he was had planned to go to Egypt. I think he had planned to go to Jordan and he had to drop those off mm -hmm. at the last minute. You, you don't have a lot of options. I mean, I did it in 1974, uh, cross overland from Paris to Kathmandu. Um, and uh, I took more or less the same journey in 1974, uh, the same route. Um, there just isn't, there aren't that many roads, quite honestly. Right. I mean, the remarkable thing with Gordon are all his side trips are extraordinary. Yes. Great. Well, I will be sure to relay that question, that uh, answer to the to the front desk staff. Um, Karen, you touched on this a little bit during your presentation, but um, in a time before Google Translate, uh, really, what were some of the other ways that Gordon navigated the language challenge, or did he encounter much of a language barrier? Um, well, I would say probably half the countries used to be British colonies. So there were a number of people that um, spoke English there. So that, that helped him. But beyond that, uh, as I mentioned, he would talk to the, the students who generally knew English, and he would talk to the um, school principals, the superintendents, and the teachers that spoke English. But general day to day, he, if the people didn't speak English, he got very good at gesturing kind of his own version of sign language. He got very good and could communicate with them. Great. Yeah. Um, so I know he never took another motorcycle journey after this one, um, but did he ever have the opportunity to visit uh, some of the countries that he, he spent time in on the trip? Um, 
Yes, I would say he's probably visited most of these countries again. Um, as when I was about 13, he took the whole family on a trip and we went to India, Singapore, Nepal, um, Bali, Japan. So he went all those places. Plus um, with his company, he had a, a plant in India. He had a plant in a lot of these countries. The only ones I can think of that he may not have gone back to would have been Iran, Iraq. But I think almost everything else he's been to, back to. I know he's been back to Burma and Laos mm -hmm. later as well. That's great. Yeah. So I think with that, um, we can turn it over to audience questions. We have a few minutes left um, before we hit two o'clock. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, did, and, uh, did George and Judy accompany him the entire way? Uh, George and Judy went with him, but uh, I'm trying to think. It was um, on their way to Iraq. They they have an issue. Um, there's two routes that you can go, and and in the map, in the story map, the, I actually put a map in there showing the two routes. But one of them went north, and it went up in the mountains, and that was too hard for my father. And this was winter time, so the conditions weren't that good to be driving in the mountains. Um, so my father could not go that way. So he ended up taking the southern route, which included a train. But George didn't want to pay the $50 to put his car on the train. So he chose the north route. And they actually lost each other for a month. In fact, um, they were supposed to meet up in Tehran, Tehran and my father ended up telling the U.S. Embassy to put a search for him because they hadn't shown up. What had happened is he had zigzagged across the country and finally had to go on the south route like my father did. Um, there were a few other times um, my father lost his passport. <laughs> that slowed him down for a while, and George and Judy didn't want to wait for him. And I can't remember exactly when they parted for good. It might have been about the I know they went to Nepal together. Um, that might have been the end of it because my father had to go back to Calcutta and it took him so long to sell the motorcycle that I think George and Judy went on. But they kept in contact. They had set up a lot of American Express um, locations where they could leave notes for each other. So they, they kept tabs on each other. <laughs> That's great, I love it. Um, Taking a look at the questions here, uh, so someone wants to know about the storybook and accessing it um, and how much time they have to access it. So our plan at the museum is to basically have this live forever on the website. Um, we don't have any plans to take it down, you know, within a month or, or at the end of the exhibition. Um, really, we want this to live on. And um, for those of you uh, who, who may not be following the museum news quite so closely, but we actually recently redesigned all of our galleries. And we have what we call the Gordon section uh, upstairs in our main gallery where we have his first icon that he purchased, um, some of his favorites. So um, I think over time we, be, we plan to incorporate more of his collections into our displays physically at the museum as well. Um, Kent, maybe you can answer this one, um, and, I, and I am familiar with the gentleman who's asking this, um, but could you comment on uh, Gordon's substantial contributions to the town of Clinton um, by way of NIPRO? Yeah, well, of course, NIPRO has a huge impact on the town of uh, Clinton, being Clinton's major employer um, since it moved, since the 1970s. And um, not only that, but Gordon was a great uh, architectural preservationist. Uh, he rescued uh, the Bigelow factories, plural, uh, virtually a quarter of a mile long of uh, 19th century American vernacular architecture. And uh, so it shouldn't be surprising to anybody who comes into the Museum of Russian Icons and sees the meticulous care with which Gordon supervised the restoration of the building um, of the museum. Uh, so he had a tremendous interest in the history of uh, Clinton through its architecture. And the museum itself, of course, attracting some 10,000 people a year. These are destination tourists. And anybody who knows Clinton uh, knows that uh, since the museum has opened, um, uh, a couple of cafes have opened, 
Um, a number of restaurants have done well uh, with their lunch traffic because our, our deliberate policy um, when uh, we opened the museum, and Gordon was right behind this, was not to have a restaurant, uh, but to encourage people to enjoy uh, the town of Clinton. And it's also why Gordon put the Museum of Russian Icons right in town, right on the town's main um, uh, public garden, Central Park, uh, adjacent to High Street, the main uh, merchant uh, thoroughfare for the city. And so the uh, fortunes and the success of Clinton itself, whether it be its public schools or its institutions or its merchants, is of extremely uh, significant uh, interest to us um, who run the Museum of Russian Icons. Yes, thank you, Kent. Um, really, you know, Gordon was all about community and we at the museum are trying to, um, Everything we do is in that spirit. You know, how can we be a resource for the town of Clinton and, and have an exchange and have a partnership? So um, the town is healthy and, and vibrant because of what Gordon did, really. Um, and it's just, again, remarkable. So I think that's it for questions right now. Um, I don't see, um, yeah, I don't see anything else coming in. So thank you. Uh, for those wondering, uh, the exhibition is on view until the end of September, September 27th. Um, and if you would like to visit the museum, um, please visit our website, give us a call, make a reservation, and we would be happy to help you. So thank you all again. Um, stay tuned for my follow-up email, which will go out mid this week. And um, thank you again. And thank you to our panelists for all your hard work in, in this, in putting this together. <laughs>